Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Wes Wagner. I'm with Red Panda, and today's presentation is, uh, as you can see on the title slide, titled AI in Action, How to Bring Real-Time Decision-Making to AI ML. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be covering today, I try to make this presentation oriented towards beginner to mid-level model builders. I'm not going to go super deep into the weeds through the slides, but we definitely can go deeper during Q&A. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. If they're really context sensitive, they may even uh, show up for me here and I can answer them as we go along. Um, also, we will handle it as uh, part of the Q&A session. We're going to do about 30 minutes of, to 35 minutes of presentation and demo. And then we're going to have a fairly robust Q&A session. So just so that everybody knows, uh, TechCrunch, they're recording this. They're going to be providing uh, this video to everybody. So you're going to get a copy of this slides and a link to the recording from them as part of your participation. And feel free to stay through the end through the Q&A as well. And we'll have some uh, things that you can get for free and some giveaways and stuff that uh, might be worthwhile to you. And I always like to have this nice little joke here. It's, this is not a large language learning model presentation. I know everybody is uh, generative, generative AI is the rage, but this is going to be some really old school um, regression Bayesian style decision making using real time data and crunching numbers. So if you uh, haven't done a lot of that, hopefully you can follow and keep up. But this is, uh, this is how you do things that are like business decisions. And so I really like to start talking about like what's, what's the real difference as data scientists that we run into when we're trying to move from the batch type data that our data engineers have traditionally given us to make you know, batch decisions. We might be have asked to make models like, how do you predict my sales for next month? Um, why, why are the, you know, trucks, you know, getting less fuel mileage, like just things like this, where you're asked to make basically do analytics on large batches of data. So if you, uh, if you think about that, okay, well, what happens if you need to make decisions real time? Like what happened in the last five minutes? What happened in the last three minutes? That's very difficult to do with this uh, batch processing that we're all used to building models off of. So when you get events instead of batch data, they typically arrive in real time. Preferably they arrive in order, like how they actually happened in reality. You're going to get them from multiple sources and the as a data scientist, you need to aggregate all that information. You have to transform it into discrete events. You have to make all of your own features. So how does this really change our process of how we build models? And Strangely enough, the process doesn't change a lot. It's more of the cadence of how you do things that change. So we're still going to collect our data, but instead of like collecting it a month at a time, we may collect and aggregate it a couple minutes at a time or even a couple seconds at a time. Those engineer those features will get engineered. You know, when we're doing this for initial model training, we're going to simulate that process of that data coming in at those types of time cadences to train and refine and build our models. We're still going to select our best models through a process of figuring out which ones are the most accurate, the most accurate over time. We're gonna promote those models to live in some type of ML operations. And we're gonna collect performance data about those models. But it's all going to run a little bit differently when you're doing this as real-time event data versus large batch jobs. So let's, Think of a practical example. Let's let's say I have a warehouse. It has tons of robots, conveyor belts, sensors, machinery, and all of these things need to be picked by the robots, put in the particular slots, pulled out for being broken down. And you know, a modern automated warehouse distribution system is a very complex, 
collection of interdependent equipment. And it's important for me as an operator that it all runs with as few interruptions as possible. So what are we gonna do with all that? Well, we need to collect all that data. And all that data is being gonna be coming from distinct components. Like you're gonna have your motors, your robotic arms, your temperature sensors, et cetera. You may use, it may all run like off of MQTT. And at the end of the day, you need a common interface to pull all this stuff together so that you have one place that you can aggregate all this. And this is where technology like Red Panda or Kafka helps. And Red Panda is a Kafka API supporting engine that you know is higher scale, better than Kafka in some ways. And we'll provide some links so you can learn a little bit about Red Panda in particular. And for the rest of this, I'm just going to talk about Kafka, but I'm really meaning it as a, as a protocol, a way of using the API to exchange data in a ubiquitous way that supports a lot of different technologies. So you can get all of this information into one place so that you can build models, score models, and work with models. So I have all my event data, but I might also want to enrich that data in order to build a model. Like say I wanna pull in the maintenance ERP database so that I can get discrete events and turn those into events in the stream such as this motor was serviced on such and such date. Well, that might turn into a feature of this motor was last serviced X number of minutes ago. And you may even enrich that further by saying it was done by this person in particular. And there's a lot of, you know, you can continue to add more and more features and events to the model by putting this into one aggregated place and then now that you have all that data aggregated, what do you do with it? Well, we're used to building sometimes models with time aware features. For example, you know, when we're building a sales forecasting, we might build lag features of like, this was how many days it's been since a customer has last contacted us. This is the number of days since the last incident. This was their satisfaction score 30 days ago. This was their satisfaction score 90 days ago. Well, we need to do that real time. And to do that real time with a lot of data, we need real time tools. And for just like an example, Flink is a very common technology. People will connect to Kafka to do these types of transfer transformations, to build all of your deltas, your minimums, your maximums, your variances, your windows, all of the things that you might need to build a really good model. So um, at the end of the day, when you've made all those transformations, on some level, you've actually recompacted all of those events down to a micro batch that you can train based on. And that gets this data back to a format that you're familiar with and know how to build models and score. So. The nice thing about this is that you can also use the same language to do all the real-time transforms for scoring. Since you've built all these transforms to build these events out to create a good simulated data stack, it's also the same transform you use real-time when you need to score your model to say, will this engine break down in the factory? So now that you have all that data back into a topic that has it fully enriched, what do you do with it? Well, you can train based on that topic, just like you would with any other batch database. Your All of your standard tools all have hook-ins to Kafka. Almost anything like Pandas, you know, Scikit, your you know, TensorFlow, DataIQ, DataRobot, Profit, et cetera, all these things can talk to, talk to Kafka, get that data out, build models, test models, go through survivor, you know, training and all that sort of things, and ultimately arrive at a model that's able to score real-time data. And obviously, you know, you need to do all the normal things that you would do. You need to iterate on this model. You need to build more features. You need to do, you know, feature importance rank ensembling to like take features away that aren't really giving you signal in order to make the models more efficient. It's just, now you've got real-time data as opposed to the batches that you're used to. So how do you choose your best models when you've moved to real-time? And this really comes down to like time-aware features are really the key to getting a really solid 
real-time model. Everything's going to be based on what's happening, the order it happened in, when it happened, et cetera. So all of your time-aware features are generally going to give you the most signal. Because of that, instead, you need to backtest when you're trying to figure out which are the best models rather than using you know, standard cross-validation techniques. So what you do is you take your model and you say, hey, uh, you know, yesterday, each 30 minutes, I'm going to run this thing to see how accurate it was based on historical information. And the ones that perform the best over time are the ones I'm going to give more compute to try to enhance. And at the end of the day, you kind of have to do a survival of the fittest type testing in order to narrow down your model search and then build them deeper. The other thing that you have to do when building these models, and this is extremely important, is you need to use reasonable lags and windows that have the capacity to be calculated real time. If you do things like, I'm going to use a window of every second, that's probably not going to work for our factory because a lot of those, a lot of that stuff is going to come in, it's going to trickle in, the data might be, you know, three seconds old, five seconds old, 30 seconds old. They may represent like things on the sensors that it was observing, you know, a cadence ago. So you have to choose reasonable lags and windows that will make sense once the model goes into production. And the other thing that you frequently have to do when building these models is you need to make sure that you have a really good system for imputing missing values. Like what's imputing? That's like, if, my va if the value didn't come in, I'm going to make my best statistical guess of what it is. If I can't do that, I might like replace with an average. You're gonna need, you need to choose methods based on the nature of the data that's likely to create the best substitution for those missing values. Because in the, the real world, sometimes data doesn't show up on time. So if we think about that, what, what does that mean if we try to build a model for this you know, hypothetical warehouse? Well, what if we wanted the probability of breakdown for each component in the next 30 minutes? Because 30 minutes is enough time for me to get a person out onto the floor and really take a look at something and, and try to prevent it from happening. So, if we build this model, again, we would use our same transforms that we did our training data. We know that it's not going, it may not arrive in time. We want to be prepared for that. But what's really interesting is when you start to get into these real world concepts, it can often be useful to run multiple models. Um, and just in case some of them either don't complete in time, like it, maybe it takes me, my, my model, like five minutes to get that 30 minute estimate and another model can complete in 30 seconds that isn't quite as accurate but it's still pretty decent and i may want to respond to that or be prepared to respond to that just in case the five minute model which is more accurate really confirms what the 30 second model said so there's a lot of options you have when doing real time in terms of structuring how you're going to make your business decisions um, that gets us to the whole thing like you really want a decision engine rather than just one model when you're doing real-time decision-making with data that's coming in like this, because there are going to be models that break. There's going to be times when you don't get the data. And there, if you really want to explore this, there's a whole world out there of how to do things like multi-arm bandit exploitation that you can look into as to how you can take multiple models and take a re reasonably good guess at the, which model is the most accurate in this particular circumstance. Now, the other thing that you need to do is capture all of your actuals, like what really happened on the floor that day so that you can compare it against what all of your models have done. And that way you can have this knowledge of how accurate the model really was when it met the real world. Now, this may sound like a lot of data handling, and it really is, but fortunately, when you use like Red Panda or Kafka, you have a really powerful asynchronous message tool that can handle that and give you all the loose coupling that you need to make this happen. And you can use it for doing your actual real-time scoring and decision-making too. So a little bit of an eye chart, but it kind of gives you an idea of how this 
all comes together. So I have all my data. I've got my I've got Flink making my transforms that are going to give me my feature topics. I'm going to use that information and make my model predictions. My decision engine is going to look across those models and make a decision within whatever tax time is needed, and that goes into the decision queue. Your operations team is listening to that decision queue. They're sending back the real results of what happens from that. And then you can look across all that and build your MLOP statistics. And this is kind of that life cycle of how all the data keeps churning real time through this cadence. And now you have the information you need to make training data too, because you essentially have a labeled set. What I expect, what I predicted, what I expected, what really happened. So with that, I'm going to move over to what I like to call a, a simple but not so practical demo. And I, I'm gonna tell you this model that I've put together here is extremely brain dead. Like I would never run this model like for anything real. It was designed to be uh, boneheadedly simple in order to get the topics across. But obviously if you were building a real model, you would go far deeper and use better data sets, et cetera. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a model that looks at all of the aggregate air traffic information from uh, essentially like the open API from FlightAware. Um, it's gonna take that current flight data and now I'm using the free version so I can only grab it every hour. So that's gonna be my cadence. But obviously if this were like real flight control data, you'd have a lot shorter cadence than that what the current weather conditions are in major cities. We know that at the time we make a prediction. We're also gonna look at the forecasted weather conditions in major cities. And mind you, forecasts can be wrong, but that's good because you know they're gonna have a certain amount of wrongness. You, your model can learn that over time. And it's important to not use the real future weather because we don't know that at the moment. And this is, goes back to what data you actually have available at the time you make the decision. And this is really key because if you accidentally use data you can't possibly know, you're gonna spend a lot of time building a model. It's gonna look really accurate and you're, you're gonna ask operations to implement it. And they say, well, we can't provide you that data. It comes from the future. You don't want that. So my goal at the end of this is going to be to have a model that can predict the total planes in the air in the United States over our territory one hour forward in time. And I'm going to get these slides in just so you have these resources too. Um, one of the things that you can do if you want to learn more about Red Panda and just Kafka in general and how to, how to use it, we have the Red Panda University. Uh, it'll teach you how to use Red Panda in particular, Kafka in general, very useful stuff there. And you, it's all free, it's self-paced, it's all online learning. And I emphasize again, free, we don't have any upcharges or special content or anything. Absolutely use it to learn more about how to use Kafka protocol. And the other thing that you, we can provide you if you scan this QR code, and if you don't get it in time, you can go back to the replay. You can send away to us for a copy of this report. It's the uh, state of streaming data. We'll just send it complimentary to you in the mail. You can get a hard copy. Um, I think it'll provide you a soft copy too. I actually should have asked about that before the presentation, but we'll definitely send it to you one way or the other if you scan that QR code. So onto the, onto the demo. Um, one of the, one of the things that, you know, like when you're working with real time data is you need all of your data to be in order. I had a peer of mine who actually set up these APIs for me to help. And it just constantly dumps the current weather, the current air flights, et cetera, all in a one hour cadence into red Panda. So I'm getting all of these events real time. So one of the things that I wanted to do is change this to just like US flight data. So I grab 
this, it, the, the original data stream was all flights in the world. And I want to look only at commercial flights. So this is something that you would typically do real time with like your Flink transforms. But I'm going to kind of just show this to you in more of a batch format so that you can kind of understand it in your head. Because if it was just a daemon running in the background, it wouldn't be all that particularly meaningful. So I connect to the Kafka server. I you know, get set up all my keys. And importantly, I, as I grab my consumer information, I'm going to create this nice little bounding box that says this is like the square. I'm going to consider the US for this purpose. And I, re and I produced that back to a topic. And now I have a topic that's just the US flight data. So having filtered that, what I do next is I take all that information in. So I, I've got it. And I've sorted it by time so that it, for me, it's like it's arriving real time like it's supposed to. But now I need to look at this like it's a cadence of some form. I need to take this information and turn it into meaningful windows that I can predict. So I'm going to resample this data down so that everything that's in a one hour block that is unique is considered a flight that existed within that one hour time frame because I'm going to try to predict how many total planes circuited through the air in the next hour forward in the future. And so I have all the data on the flights. I've got their position, their longitude, their latitude, et cetera. I could technically build features off of a ton of this stuff, but to keep the model simple, I'm just simply going to do planes in the air and what their average altitude is across all the planes. Very, very basic, very boneheaded features. Obviously, these would not be what you would do if you were building a model that you wanted to be super accurate. But this gives you a simple example of how you can take this large chunk of data, take one hour windows, build some aggregates. These would be your transforms in Flink that were running every like one minute, 30 seconds, five seconds, etc. And then when I'm done, I rebroadcast that out to a new topic, which is my aggregate flight data. Now, I want to enhance that data. It's not just enough to have count planes in the air. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add weather, like I said. So I bring in the current weather, which again is being published to a current topic. I have that, all that weathered information was in JSON. I have to flatten it, turn it into meaningful columns that are useful to me. And now I can rebroadcast that out. And in this case, just for my particular model, I'm only going to concern myself with the weather in Chicago. Chicago can be really disruptive to air traffic. I'm just going to pick that, pick on them. I probably would like in a real model do this with a lot of key hubs and get a lot of telemetry from key hubs and things like that of like what's forward expectations. But I'm just going to pick on Chicago for this demo. So I now have broad rebroadcast that into a particular Chicago weather topic. Again, leveraging Kafka, I can keep all these streams running real time if I wanted to. So now that I have that weather from Chicago, what am I going to do with it? Well, I'm going to join my US flight data information with my Chicago weather. And I'm going to take those values and I'm going to resample it all down to hourly cadences like it needs to be. I'm going to fix all this up. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my time, what the weather was, what the wind speed was over that time. I can join that with my hourly resampled flight data. So now every plane has the weather in Chicago attached to it and its distance from Chicago, potentially. I'm going to then pull all this together and say how many planes are within, you see this near Chicago? I calculate that out as how many planes are within 100 miles of Chicago, what the wind speed in Chicago is at the time, um, the, are my aggregate planes in the air, the average altitude, and I can reprocess that out as a topic as this is my aggregate of everything 
near Chicago that is going to be at a particular amount of wind, et cetera. So now I know my proportion of planes near Chicago, it's windy, et cetera. And I have built these features up. So after I've done that, what I can do next is I can actually build a model based on it. And so this is my, uh, let, me, let me share out my Google Colab notebook. So let's do, I have to share you a different window because I have to change uh, technologies here. And we will get back to my Google Colab. Um, Google Colab is like a free service again, recommended. If you just want a notebook on demand, it can be pretty useful. My local Mac can't run profit because um, processor issues. So I'm using a virtual environment in Google to do this because for some reason, uh, Facebook and profit doesn't like ARM processors. So like usual, you have to bounce around technology to make things work sometimes in this space. It's a little bleeding edge. So I install profit. I install my Kafka library, which, you know, most common Python library for Kafka is actually produced by the Confluent team, but it's open source. It's a decent library, so I use it. And so what I have here is I'm going to take, I'm going to create a new subscription and I'm going to read from the aggregate with Chicago, that topic that I built. I'm going to read it all the way to the end and get it into a Pandas data, data frame. So it's my planes in the air, my average altitude, my average lag in, et cetera. So you can see these, this is my feature stream that I created. So now that I have this feature stream, I can build my profit model and I'm going to add in my average lag as a regressor, my wind speed and the planes being near Chicago. So instead of just fitting for the total value, I'm going to give profit these extra features to work with. And that makes my profit model. And now I'm going to make a prediction for the last row in my data set. After I uh, build this here and, bought, well, I removed the last line from my data set up here just in case it wasn't obvious. And then I get my model. So that's how you can take your structured data that's in all these streams, get it out to an actual feature stream, start making predictions. And really you need to take these high level concepts and compress them down to shorter cadences and obviously um, much more accurate features that are going to build you a better model. So that's, uh, that's it for the slides and demo. We can move on to questions and answer session and feel free to ask me like even deep questions if you want. And I'm gonna stop my share at the moment. Yeah, not, not seeing one come in yet. I'll actually pull one out from like uh, when I was at, uh, when I was at KCON, I actually, um, uh, some, okay, somebody from the audience wants to know if notebooks or code will be shared after. Um, I'm gonna go with maybe on that. I've, hoping to turn this actually into a blog series sometime soon. So it'll actually show up on the Red Panda blogs that will have the assets that you need to follow along and build this yourself. So that's going to be a maybe, but I just don't know the exact timing of it. Um, I'm kind of expecting maybe January, February. I've been trying to work on packaging this up so that it's more friendly and consumable. So that's going to go with the maybe. Um, when I was at uh, KCON, um, one of the questions that somebody asked that was really critical was what happens if you change one of your decisions? Like let's say on the factory floor one, somebody actually goes out and does preventative maintenance on a machine. And so this is a, this is a really good question because one of the things that you can do in AI very frequently if you're not careful is you can poison your future training data when you start changing your behavior based on your predictions. And so it's important to capture those events and 
take that data and tag it as it comes back from operations of we did something so that you don't use that data verbatim in your training set. And instead, you either need to deal with either deleting it and imputing it, creating new synthetic data for it. Um, you need to apply various procedures based on the nature of the data and the types of features that they are so that it doesn't have an undue influence on your retraining cycles. And so that's extremely important to keep in mind when you start making these decisions is to log those decisions when your behavior has changed and fact refactor that before you use it for your training again. So um, another question is how do you see this used in e-commerce? Um, so if you think about like driving consumer behavior, if you have like applications like ClickHouse where you can get all this type of stuff real time, uh, you can potentially look at those behaviors and start building models in order to target people real time more selectively potentially as well. So like, is, for example, you might be able to see trends like people currently who are looking at this in particular today are buying this and they are doing looking at these other things it may actually organically pick up social trends that are going on outside the system and recognizing those real time and adjusting the decisions of what you're going to recommend to people so this is where like in things like e-commerce real time rather than just like like a very frequent model people will build for like e-commerce. A great example is uh, next best offer models where you just use past consumer behavior to modify what you're going to offer somebody based on their current behavior. You'll build a next best offer model, but those are built in a batch format and they don't really respond to real time trends as they're happening. If you build a real time model that emulates next best offer, based on current trends and current behavior, you can kind of pull that cadence down and get a little more accuracy out of it. So um, let's see, the next question here. Okay, yeah, so there's a question about um, how do I, uh, how do I, what are you supposed to do when you have missing data being approximated? I didn't do that in my example because I, I had a clean stream um, so I can't showcase that in particular, but I'll talk about it a little more to help understand this. Let's say there was an API failure and the planes in the air were missing. Now, some of the things that I can do in order to statistically, I could do something like do a statistical approximation and, and insert that record uh, as a substitute. So for example, I might use the average number of planes for that day of the week historically factored based on year over year growth and call that good enough. And that way it just doesn't create this crater in your training set that your model doesn't know how to deal with. Now, there are certain model types that would respond to a missing value better, like neural models respond to missing better values better than say um, XG boost or random forest regression. So like your mileage could vary. You may not need to do that if you're using deep neural models because they, they just simply tend to find a way to ignore missing values better. But this is kind of like one of those, your mileage may vary on how much value imputing missing values provides to you. And it's again, something you kind of have to test and figure out and read some of the academic papers on what's the best way to create an imputed missing value for a particular model type. Okay, if, if I, here we are, here's a good one. If I don't see historical streaming data to train initial models, what are my options? So a lot of times, like for example, we have, a, we, our data isn't in a stream already, but we have historical data in our databases that have things like timestamps and change data, et cetera. And so oftentimes what you need to do in order to build something like that out is you need to go back and functionally put those records back into order and turn them more into like uh, event and change records instead of 
um, just taking them flat as they existed in the file. That way you get everything in order the way that you need it to build windows and lags and everything like that. So that's a, it's really a data engineering pro project at that point, which, you know, it's a heavy lift, but that's oftentimes what you have to do to like get this whole process started because we often have years of data, but we didn't collect it as events. We collected it some other way. Um, some somebody else uh, somebody else asked uh, like uh, following up the ecom question. What other dependencies? What other dependencies do you have to do what you've suggested? That sounds very tech intensive. Yes, uh, real time ecom decision making is very tech intensive. You have to have a lot of like in, you have to have a lot of integration with your e-commerce properties. That's why like people use things like ClickHouse. ClickHouse naturally integrates with Kafka really well. That way, all of the activity that's happening in ecom gets converted into events that can then be used. And ClickHouse is like a real-time event capturing ecom platform. Um, uh, that would help you not have to like instrument all of your code yourself, like from scratch, like building from absolutely nothing. Yeah. So I, somebody asked, did you integrate the forecasted weather data? Did I miss it? Um, yeah, you probably missed it. One of the things that I did when I was using the, uh, the forecasted weather data, um, I was grabbing the uh, forecast from the same stream and then like ticking it back one space so that it was taking the one hour forecast and applying it to the current row. Um, I actually used the forecasted data rather than the real time because real time was actually a little bit tricky because I was doing one hour windows and stuff. So uh, probably well, I'll clarify that and make that a little more clean for the blog version. Um, I just again, like to thank everybody for showing up, watching. If you have any more questions, obviously you can get in contact with us. Uh, I'm also Wes at redpanda.com. If you just want to send me a random email, we also have a community Slack. I'm on the community Slack, so you can tag me there if you want to try to get a conversation about something. And again, the, there was a collection of links that went out for follow up into the chat that you can use to get more information about just generally Red Panda, Kafka, our university. And I'll just reiterate again, a main reason why a lot of data scientists end up in the uh, Kafka ecosystem is just a ubiquitous API that most data assets speak. And so it's kind of like a very common interchange language to get data out of any type of like databases, sources, or other, you know, pub sub streams, et cetera, and get it into one place that everybody talks. And if you have any other questions about Red Panda, obviously you can find us at redpanda.com. Not seeing any other uh, Q&A questions coming in, we'll wrap up. And I really do appreciate your time and attendance. And please reach out if you have any more questions for us. Thank you.